Hi, my name's Stuart Lynch, and this is the second of a nine-part series on understanding how to parse JSON using the Codable protocol in Swift and Swift UI. In this video, we'll explore the basics of decoding JSON. We'll start with simple JSON objects and the decodable protocol. We'll look at having optional properties. We'll take a look at JSON arrays and more complex objects, and finish with some strategies on building your structs and classes based on the JSON data structure. If this is something that you're interested in, keep watching. First of all, if you want to work along with me, be sure to download the starter project. A link is in the notes below. It's an Xcode playground that has multiple files that we'll be using for the next seven videos. If the file in your Xcode project doesn't look like this, then you need to make sure that, first of all, you choose to Show Rendered Markup from the Edit menu. And also make sure that you show the left sidebar. Now the first page is this introduction page that you can use to navigate to the different pages. Each one will be a different video in this series. Each page also has navigation that lets you go to the previous and next page, or back home to this introduction or table of contents. You can also navigate by clicking on the files in the sidebar. Let's get started by getting down to basics and decoding a simple JSON structure. Before we start looking at decoding JSON from a file or an API, let's just first look at how we can decode JSON from some strings. With Xcode, we can represent multi-line strings by enclosing the lines within triple quotes. So for our purposes, what we need to focus on is the structure between the triple quotes. Here we have two structures, person1json and person2json. They're almost identical, but the second is missing the partner key value pair. If we want to decode this data, we need to make sure that we take care of that, but I'm getting ahead of myself. First, let me build a struct that represents this first object. We can simply create properties that use the key values as the variable or constant name, and then define the type as we see it. For example, name is string, age is an int, and so on. If we want to be able to decode JSON using this struct, we must make the struct conform to the decodable protocol. For a struct to be decodable, all of its properties have to be decodable as well. Fortunately for us, all of the basic Swift types are already decodable, so we don't have to do anything else. If a properties type is not decodable, Xcode will let you know, and we'll have to define our own coding keys to accommodate that. And we'll take a look at that shortly. So how do we decode? We'll be repeating this process many times, but it goes like this. First of all, we normally define a constant decoder as the JSON decoder. The JSON decoder requires a data object to decode, but our two constants are strings. Later on in this series, we'll be getting our JSON from a file or from an API request, in which case you already have a data object. But to start out, so we can work in the playground, we're starting with strings that need to be converted to data objects. We can use a single line of code to get the data and assign it to a new constant that we can then decode. When converting a string into data, the return type is optional, but you can safely force unwrap it. Strings in Swift are Unicode internally, so encoding a string using a Unicode encoding will always succeed. The next step is to decode the data using our decoder. We want to decode the object into a person struct, so we use person.self here. Our decoder is decoding from our data into a person. Now this decoding procedure can fail, so we have to use try, and to be safe we should use an optional try catch block, but we'll get to that shortly, so let's assume that our data is good and just use try exclamation mark, so no need for a do catch block. Now let's print out person1.name and person1.partner. Both are OK. Well, let's try the same for person2. Remember, person2 is missing the partner key value pair. We'll just duplicate and change the number to 2. We can use the same decoder.
but we get a fatal error as we'd expect because the second object has something missing. This is easy enough to fix though, we just change the partner property to an optional and run again. It works though we do get the optional keyword that we'll have to deal with and we get a couple of warnings, but I'm not going to worry about that right now. Let's move on, but first let's comment out this print statements so that we can see what's going on in the console for the next example. In the last example we looked at two different JSON objects. We did that for comparison. What if we put both of these objects into an array? Can we decode these? Of course we can. This is valid JSON, so we should be able to decode it just fine. We already have our person struct, so we can use it again. Let's go through the process. Convert our string to data and assign it to a constant called person JSON data. Next, we can use our decoder to decode the data into an array. We're decoding from the person's JSON data and putting it into an, an array of person. Don't forget to always add dot self. Let's loop through the data now and print out some information. This time we know that the partner is optional, so let's handle that case with a no coalescing operator and assign the value of none to the person.partner if it's nil. Great, we're on a roll. Now we've never used the person's sign, and likely never will. So even though that's part of the JSON object, in one of the key value pairs, there is no need to decode it, so we can eliminate it from our struct. You can pick and choose which values from the JSON feed that you wish to decode, and build your structs or classes accordingly. Running once more, we see no errors. Moving on, let's look at this more complex object. It has two keys, family name, which is a string, and members, which is an array of JSON objects. These JSON objects just happen to be our person objects, which we already have a struct for. So we can define our decodable struct for family like this. This works because string is decodable, and we already know that person is decodable too. So here we go again with our procedure. We convert the string to data using UTF-8. We try to decode the data, and this time we are going from family JSON to a single family JSON object. and we can print myfamily.name and then loop through each of the members of the family and print their names. As we see, we get our family name as Smith and the two persons, James and Mary. In the real world, you won't likely have one of the structs already created like we had with our person struct so let's see how we should really deal with this JSON when we're building our structs or classes. But first let's comment out these print statements. I'm going to start off the same way but call my struct family2 and make sure it's a decodable struct. The family name key is still going to be the family name string property, but I want to define my person object within the family2 struct. So I'll just copy from before and paste it here. Now I can define members as an array of this person struct. Notice we're picking family2.person as the struct. The family2 part can be left out because it will look inside the parent struct for a match first before going outside to look for any others of the same name. Now one more thing. I realize that gender is always going to be one of three options. Male, female, or other. So include a new enum to cover this and make it string and decodable. By having a raw value type like string and adopting decodable in its declaration, gender automatically conforms to decodable without any additional code. So I can change gender now to type gender. 
The family JSON hasn't changed, but we can copy the decoder and print statement and loop and just change the constant and struct to add a number 2 to it to reflect our new struct and constant. Running once more, we see we get the same results, seeing that the raw value from the enum gets decoded properly as a string. I hope you've enjoyed this video and have learned something. If you did, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. That will encourage me to keep on creating more like this in an effort to help new and existing iOS developers hone their skills and move on to the next level. I am most active on Twitter, so be sure to follow me there and get all the latest news of what I'm up to.